So I'm very happy to be speaking to Tom Simmons today. Tom Simmons is the CEO at Immerse, a VR training company uh, that is developing a VR training platform and a marketplace for VR training apps for corporate and uh, uh, companies looking to develop uh, or place their already developed uh, VR training apps within their marketplace. Uh, thank you for joining us, Tom. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to ask you about a generic explanation of what Immerse does and this kind of uh, dual scenario that I explained about the platform and about the marketplace. Could you please unravel this and explain a, a little bit, unbundle it, what, what exactly it is? I can unravel and unbundle, yes. <laughs> um, so we're a business that has been focused for 10 years on the combination of immersive technology and learning. Uh, and so in the early years before the arrival of um, the consumer VR devices, it was very much kind of uh, a, a PC-based experience using live voice and interaction using really gaming technology, so kind of avatar-based learning. And then once um, the, the Oculus Rift um, arrived on the scene, we pivoted uh, and really focused on integrating those headsets into a truly immersive experience. I think anyone that is familiar with VR knows that the killer app uh, for VR in enterprise is training. It's about delivering this incredibly focused, interactive and data rich experience. Um, uh, and so that that is really where we have been focused and continue to be. Um, th there's kind of two key parts to our proposition. There is the platform, um, which is uh, a, a very complex combination of different technologies, uh, but delivered in a way that's highly intuitive, like all good tech. Um, and so it's a platform that allows you to do three things. It allows you to deliver uh, a VR-based 3D experience delivered to a headset. So all the most recognized headsets that people will be familiar with um the meta headset the quest which probably is what well, is it's 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 the most widely distributed we also work with pico um we're starting to work with lenovo and i'm sure at some point we'll have a good look at the vision pro um so Hot you know, it, yeah it's a very exciting week for everyone that works in this category because apple's arrival is a is a super strong validation of a technology um, and a commitment to the future, I think we've all been waiting for them to to arrive on the scene. So there's a there's a nice buzz that is moving around the industry. But the platform is really all about delivering this 3D experience that can be um, experienced as a single learner going in, maybe doing some familiarization with a new process, a new facility. It can be an experience where there are multiple people um, present in the same virtual environment. And, you know, we can have maybe 10 people in headsets in 10 different countries, all joining together, performing a task, listening to a trainer, uh, walking people through some, some steps. Um, and then also being able to deliver the experience to a PC or a mobile device. So you could have three people on those three different devices they clearly would all have different experiences. Uh, the person in the headset is going to get the most rich experience. But then if I'm training you, let's say, I don't have to be in the headset myself because I, I understand the process. Uh, but I need to be able to see what you are doing in the headset and I need to be able to talk to you. And you need to be able to, to talk yeah. to me. So this is really all about scaling because we're far from the point where everyone has a VR headset. We all know that's not the case. And so in order to drive maximum value for the enterprise, you need to be able to offer those three different um, access points. So first, it's a platform that can deliver that content at scale. It's a cloud-based platform, obviously. One. Two, and this is increasingly important as we take companies who are now moving beyond the first proof of concept, they've already seen that this is 
an incredibly powerful way of training. No one ever puts a headset on and says, mm, no, let's keep everyone in a classroom. You know, you, you, yeah. you don't really need to drive that point too hard anymore. You did at the beginning, but not now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that that key point that really differentiates this learning, this modality of learning from classroom and e-learning is the data that you can collect. And so we're moving from uh, a world where training, evaluation, assessment is very binary, has been very binary, pass, fail, 10 out of 20, into something that is much, much richer, where you can you know, view in tiny steps how someone is performing a specific task. Now, for many companies, they don't need that kind of granularity, but certain clients we have yeah. in life sciences, they want to understand in, in milliseconds how someone is performing a task because they want to measure productivity gain. So the second part around the data, you know, is it is very important. Seven or eight years ago, no one knew what to do with the data. No yeah. one was thinking about the data. But yeah. now, as we, you know, win new customers, we educate existing ones, the data is is front and center. So that's the second part of what the platform does. And then the third part, and it's perhaps the less kind of glamorous piece, but it's being enterprise ready. So can you integrate with the learning management system? Um, and we're working with, with most of the major learning management systems. Why? Because you want to ensure that the data that is being collected during um, you know, your learning experience uh, is captured in a way that can then be passed back into that learning management system so that the enterprise, the learning department of enterprise has a joined up view. Uh, and I think many companies in the early phases who would have experimented with VR would have, they would have been more of an R&D type enterprise. Okay, let's just build something, not to worry about the data or really thinking about how it becomes part of this new blend. Um, now we're seeing companies say, no, if, if we are serious about scaling uh, XR within our enterprise, we need to ensure that it's properly joined up um, with the whole um, vision of how learning is being delivered and skills are assessed um and of course you know working with big blue chip companies as we do like shell and bp nestle mars you've got to have you know a very high level of security you know we've done all the uh, you know as you can imagine yes. um to get to a point where they are comfortable integrating with our platform then um you know it's a given that we're enterprise great so those are the three components parts of the platform and then as of june last year uh we launched a pretty groundbreaking marketplace uh and the marketplace is a library of standalone vr based training apps that have been um, developed by some brilliant companies um, around the world they're truly international these businesses that have specific focus on, uh, you know, a, a particular genre. So that could be, you know, the, the classic VR with, at the beginning, which was all health and safety, hazard identification, you know, where there is a high cost of failure. So if I don't shut down the equipment when I see a certain set of data or, you know, a fire, you know, there's going to be very significant consequences. So there's there's a lot of that content sitting in there. And then increasingly, you know, we're broadening into soft skills, people skills. Um, so that could be um, presentation skills, uh, managing a difficult um, appraisal, could be more cultural, you know, diversity and inclusion, uh, gender bias training. Right. Uh, so all of this content sits in the marketplace and you uh, as a company can go in and, and purchase it. Now, the great advantage of the marketplace content is that the, the, the price point is much lower than delivering uh, a custom or bespoke piece of content. You know, it's there, it's on the shelf, and you can have the content on a headset, you know, within, let's say, weeks rather than months while you're waiting for the, the custom content. So what we're trying to do is really lower the friction points 
um, for any company that is perhaps not yet into XR, those that haven't experimented or are unable to write bigger checks. Yeah. Uh, and so the marketplace is really the beginning of fostering uh, an ecosystem, a content ecosystem, uh, where we can showcase the best quality content. Uh, and an important part of the marketplace is keeping a very high quality bar. You know, so we understand, you know, as experts in the space, how to build good content um, because we've been doing it for years. Uh, and so we we apply our kind of immerse lens, you know, does this meet the grade? Is Does um, the graphical fidelity hit the right kind of level? Uh, are the learning outcomes of the module clear? Um, is the usability, the UX intuitive? All those things that we would apply ourselves if we're doing content. So, okay, if we wanted to have you know, a marketplace of a thousand titles, we probably could, but probably 80% of it wouldn't be of sufficiently high quality. So so we're trying to grow gradually, picking best of breed. We're looking at opening up new sectors. Uh, so let's say life sciences, which is a big sector for Immerse. We see a lot of growth there. We're looking at off the shelf in that domain, healthcare, another big growth area. So we're trying to offer choice. I have a couple of, uh, okay, I'll try to see, kind of recap all of this and, and please uh, do, do tell me if I, I got it all right. Uh, so first of all, the platform uh, allows uh, aid, well, training departments within corporates to uh, develop their own uh, VR training. Uh, and then that's one big functionality that you offer. Uh, that's a part of the platform. There's all the data collection part. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask, do you also offer assistance in the development part if um, uh, certain corporates, certain companies would say like, okay, I, I, I can develop this part, but I also need, you know, assistance in developing this, these, these other aspects of the training. Can you offer that? Of course. So the, the two fundamental parts that we've covered, um, the platform and the, and the marketplace, the, the facilitation of the content. So that's either the content creators importing the content that they've already built or immerse building content yeah. or the other option as you've kind of alluded to is the corporate who says we need to build our own content here um we have two um software developer kits one um for unity you know the big games engine that drives most content i would say in ar and vr and then we've just launched an Unreal uh, SDK too. So let's say you are a large corporate, you're convinced um, of the value of VR, you're hiring your own Unity developers, your own Unreal developers. By using our SDK, you can develop content straight onto the platform. Right. Um... And instead on the marketplace side, uh, uh, you have a bunch of developers who have developed uh, uh, training apps that can then be purchased at, a, of course, at a much lower price in the case of not <laughs> having to develop yeah. it on purpose. Uh, so you're talking, just to be clear, you're talking low, low tens of thousands rather than custom, you know, if you want something strong, it's gonna be, you know, potentially a hundred plus. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, you, you mentioned in the case, talking about the marketplace that you also make sure that the uh, apps that end up on, on uh, Immerse Marketplace uh, have a certain level of um, user interface uh, uh, of uh, a, a certain uh, set of thresholds that <laughs> you want to check that these meet. Um, how do you do this selection? Uh, is that once the app has already been developed or do you uh, have some uh, partner companies that you know have these set of abilities, you, you trust them enough that you you know you, you kind of are lighthearted, they, they publish great products, so these go immediately onto our marketplace once they're ready. How does that uh, process kind of uh, unfold? Well, look, I, I think when we launched back in June, we spent, I would say, a year identifying who the best content creators were. And so 
that was a process that was very collaborative. Uh, so we would say, okay, have you got unity based content? Send it across. Uh, and so I have you know, an immerse studios team. These are people that have been building VR based content for seven, eight years. And, and that that's a long time in VR. Can't, yeah. It can't be much longer than seven or eight no. years. <laughs> uh, and these are people that have, have um, delivered content for blue chip companies. So, so a very high standard. And so an understanding of what a good experience look, look, looks like exists within the team. It does not take them five days to evaluate, is this at the right level or not? It's pretty quick. You know, they send the APK to us. We, you know, we will experiment with it for maybe a few hours and we'll know whether it's ready to go or whether it needs more work. Or we will say, look, we don't think you're quite ready yet. If you can address these, let's say three or four items, then we'll take another look at it. So it's not, um, it's a manual evaluation uh, process, I would say, Luigi. It's not a, you know, we're not yet at the point where we can um, automate it. Yeah. Um, does yeah, that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, about the uh, applications, let's call them, that are coming through to your marketplace, uh, I wonder, you kind of made this distinction between uh, kind of more hands-on training on like kind of hard skills uh, and then the the uh, people skills, so kind of soft skills. I mean, I, the two things don't really equate. There's <laughs> soft skills that are not necessarily people skills, but th that's fine. Would you kind of like... Mm, uh, do you think there is kind of another distinction or would you like go forth with this kind of these kind of two categories? Is there like people skills, whereas hands on skills or are there other kinds of use cases that do not uh, 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 that do not compose uh, that are not part of these two categories? Look, I, I think it's it's always a bit dangerous to, uh, to to kind of generalize too much. But I do think that there's really there's two types. Um, that more operational skills-based training. So I'm teaching you how to operate a piece of machinery. Yeah. And that is very data focused. Mm -hmm. I would say that there is a specific way to operate a piece of machinery. There's a, an order with which you perform certain tasks or if you see something um, that is, you know, a certain set of data, uh, a, a sound, then there is a specific way to react to that um, event. Sounds it sounds a bit like a situational awareness training as well to to begin Correct. with how to react. Uh, and so, it's very easy to measure whether you can do that or not. There's only once I press that button, then the next step is prescribed. Then yeah. you have to do this. Yeah. And I can measure how long between you pressing that button and you turning that dial in, in milliseconds yeah. if I need to. And so for a industrial manufacturing application, that's why VR has been so compelling. Mm -hmm. And, and so everything that falls within that that kind of that domain on the soft skills side it's less data driven because a lot of the of the soft skills type training is about how you react in terms of what you say to an avatar speaking to you yeah. and although that can be recorded and you can set off different voice prompts and you can you can move down different branching structures uh, it's much more about changing behaviors and that you know obviously is a bit harder to measure so i could i could put you on the gender bias training module you would go through it and i could see whether you were reacting to the situations in the right way and at the end you know you'll maybe do some kind of simple evaluation. But 
once you've done it, it's harder for me to know whether you're going to apply that in real life. So in six months' time, can I be 100% certain that you will have changed your behavior or when you you are confronted by a certain situation, uh, I, I can be less confident. That's just the nature of that type of training, whether right. it's applied in the classroom or whether it's e-learning or whether it's some traditional role play. Have you been able or have you had ca cases of um synchronous learning uh, in VR being included in, in, in training. I mean, uh, I, I guess if I'm up to date, um, well, we, we don't really know about Apple yet, but mostly it, 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 synchronous in VR would have been using avatars, of course. Uh, whereas uh, I, I, I think my understanding with uh, Apple's entry uh, that, that, that this might be changing kind of, uh, we, we're gonna be discovering this soon, <laughs> um, but so, of course, there's the limitation of an avatar in the case of like transmitting facial features in, in, in VR and whatnot. But have you had uh, a component that uh, in, in certain of the trainings, were, uh, whether on the platform or on the marketplace, that included a part of synchronous VR training? I would say not yet is the simple answer to the question. I think the issue with synchronous training, so truly having the avatar react to what I'm saying um, is expensive. Mm. Yes. It's complex. Um, and we've looked at it. And of course, the companies that are providing the kind of off the shelf canned content are clearly evaluating that. So at this point, I don't think there are many solutions currently in the market that delivers that live experience. The only one I would point to is delivered by a company called Mersion, who are a, a very strong US-based company, and they have an avatar-driven experience, but the avatar is a real person speaking to you live. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um... I'm really curious to take a look at the platform. Is that possible? Do you have a video demo that you can show us about that? Yeah, we have a great um, little video that will bring to life uh, the the key points that I that I've illustrated in my my intro. Um, and so I'd suggest we play that now. Yeah, great. Thanks. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you for showing that uh, to us, Tom.
we were talking about this distinction uh, in use cases on like uh, people skills and and um, kind of operational skills. Uh, which one have you had the most of both on the uh, platform and on the marketplace? Well, look, I, I would say because when VR started, it was much more about, you know, the, the kind of replicating dangerous situations, high cost of failure, the, there was a big focus on the, the more operational hard skills side, I would say. Uh, and I think the, the players that were in soft skills seven or eight years ago were really just at the beginning um, and the user experience wasn't always brilliant. Um, so we've had more experience in developing the operational harder skills for our existing clients. Um, and, you know, when the marketplace launched, there was more health and safety hazard identification, but that's now beginning to balance out. Mm. I think, well, this is makes logical sense. And I think with the evolution of hardware for VR and XR, uh, and again, the, the entry of uh, Apple in the sphere, uh, uh, when people are going to be uh, both more uh, comfortable in wearing uh, headsets and also uh, more and more people are going to be adopting headsets, more and more companies, uh, I, I imagine that even people skills training is going, going the, the share of people skills training in VR is going to rise in this, I think is. Yeah, of course, of mm. course. I mean, uh, you know, if you look at the proportion of hard skills to soft skills within a large enterprise, you know, clearly lots more money is spent on on the softer skills side, the cultural training, the personal training, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so very exciting uh, when you were talking about data mining uh, and educational data mining, of course, uh, and uh, what kind of what, what I'd like to ask you about is what kind of data, some examples that uh, can be mined. Is it uh, very is it only mm, or in most cases, very specific data of how long does it take uh, in an operational training, for example, uh, to uh, to do a certain to, to fulfill a certain task, uh, or do you also elaborate it on a, an educational side uh, to feed the kind of meta educational data? Whether we're talking about um, well, any kind of educational uh, uh, learning meta skill, I I wouldn't say. Uh, um, um, perhaps uh, working memory, I don't think, <laughs> but any kind of that kind of data, you know, uh, um, what what kind of data is it that we're talking about? Well, uh, I think initially it's 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 data that can be captured in the headset. So the interaction of the learner in the learning environment, you know, whether they're where they're looking, how they're moving their hands because of the, the the controllers are replicated by, you know, virtual hands. So you can see, um, you know, the movement of the head, you know, increasingly you can see where the eyes are looking. You can see where the hands are moving and you can see the movement of the individual. So if it's a, it's a larger environment, you're working I don't know, in a warehouse, then, you know, you're moving around, you're covering a greater distance, obviously by, by pointing and then, and then moving. So, so there's, there's all of that situational data, I would say. Um, we're not yet at the point where we're collecting biometric data because that's, you know, you could do that, but you would need, um, you know, additional um, hardware to be able to capture that. And I think part of our push into enterprise is really all about simplicity. You know, it's already hard enough to get people to change the way that they think about training. You know the, the the really good Quest headset, the Pico headset, mobile headset are you know literally it's a it's a, it's a little container with a headset and two controllers compared to what it was at the beginning where you had a headset you had to be you know tethered to a a PC you had to set up trackers so we've travelled a long distance in the last um, eight years for for sure so. You know, we try and keep it simple. So if I said, well, look, we, we're going to collect, um, you know, heart rate data, it just makes it more complicated, yeah. you know, to be to be honest with you. Um, I think we're also at a point where we're in that early phase. So although some of our big clients are beginning to roll out at scale, 
we're not yet talking about tens of thousands of users uh, and the collection of data at real scale and then mining that um, you know, in an intelligent way to understand trends and what have you. We're not, we're not at that point yet. We will be further down the line, but that's not where we are now. And I find it very exciting that you pass on this data through being LTI compatible, pass on this data uh, uh, um, to uh, LMSs rather than be trying to be like the LMS for VR. Like, I, I think it's much better to uh, pass this data on and like, okay, you've, you've collected it, but someone else does the processing or the integration with data collected elsewhere. I think this is kind of like uh, this... Finally, the supply chain of of uh, in the educational sphere that is really getting more and more specific. Um, uh, have has have there been uh, use cases for well HR recruitment purposes? Uh, not yet, but there could be. I, I think one of the areas that we see significant growth is onboarding. So let's say you are in manufacturing, you're opening a new facility. Um, and sometimes you've got to get thousands of people up to speed very quickly. You know, you've got a, a set time frame. A lot of that familiarization of what the facility is going to look like, you know, where's the kind of the layout, the locations. And then, okay, this is the piece of equipment that you will be operating. Um, traditionally, most of that is done in a classroom, um, supplemented by e learning. And then, of course, you get your. Uh, you know, your moment to actually go into the facility and practice. But that's, uh, that, you know, normally the practice time is very short because the equipment is not there as training. It's there to produce a specific product. So if you can really authentically recreate that product, and that could be using digital twin technology or building, you know, a prototype of the equipment, um, then the speed with which you can get someone operational is significantly cut because you're gonna get them actually performing the task. These are the situations that you will encounter. Here's 10 scenarios, go in and practice, practice, learn. You know, that that's the central mantra um, of this category. It always has been, it's learning by doing. You know, it's, it's developing that, uh, um, that set of, of, of muscle memory that when you are confronted by the equipment or you see something or hear something, you know how to react because you practiced it. Yeah. Whereas if I say to you, okay, Luigi, this is the equipment. Here's 10 different scenarios. Look at these videos, maybe answer, you know, some questions. So I, I know that you've at least watched the videos and you've got some understanding. It's nowhere near as effective as me saying, right, just get in the headset, and you're going to be taken through either a very guided experience because you're doing it for the first time and you know okay step one yep. this is step two and something you hear something or you see something all the way through to an experience yeah but it's yes. really unguided and, and it's like okay you're going in i'm going to send you yeah. a link into the environment tuesday 10 o'clock and you're gonna go through it yep. and, and i will know at the end of that 15 minute assessment, whether you can do it or you can't, because you can't fake it. And there's quite quite some interesting research and uh, and literature coming uh, coming out finally, uh, kind of uh, let's say demonstrating this uh, uh, this link, and, and and of course a bunch of a bunch of literature uh, uh, on uh, how simulations and role plays are some of the most effective forms of training and vr is a great way to facilitate that even from remote uh, and not only of course uh, because of the remote uh, aspect of it but so many things so many situations that can only be simulated in vr um i did want to uh, ask you you in, in the case of well for, for a it would be lovely to take a look at some of the use cases uh, of uh, immerse uh, do you have any material you uh, would like to share about that yeah, look, uh, we have a number of great use cases that are published on the website and our YouTube channel. But I think uh, maybe if we take a look at the uh, the example with Shell, which I think is a is a great example of practically how VR can be deployed um, in a health and safety context. So let's uh, let's roll that one. <laughs>
Beautiful. Thank you, Tom. Um, I do have one more uh, kind of material that I'd like to ask you about. Um, so, amongst the content creators that are on your marketplace, uh, is there anything uh, that uh, that we could take a look at uh, uh, in that sense? Maybe any of uh, uh, their content, their demos, or kind of a library uh, of uh, of the content that is on your marketplace? Yes, of course. So uh, I think one of the companies that uh, we see as doing really strong pioneering work in the soft skills domain is a uh, is a company called Body Swaps. Uh, so I'd suggest that um, we ran uh, one of their modules because I think it's a great example of how this space uh, is evolving. It's easy to think that because you speak all the time, you know how to use your voice. But the more you practice shaping your voice, the more accomplished you'll become. Just so you know, some of these activities might require you to step outside your comfort zone a little. Let's try an experiment. Some kind of squid or octopus that wasn't really cooked. I want you to spend the next minute or two talking about something that's really familiar to you. Are you ready to put your public speaking skills to the test? Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that, Tom. Uh, very, very briefly, because I know uh, we're running out of time here, uh, I'd just like to ask you a, a very brief over overview about your uh, business uh, situation, uh, business uh, stage. Uh, what stage are you at? Uh, were you bootstrapped or venture capital funded? Are you profitable now? And therefore, uh, are you searching for investment uh, to further scale uh, your activities? Or are you at a stage in which uh, uh, this is not uh, any of your uh, uh, any of your uh, current circumstances anymore? It's uh, part of the past kind of this broad idea. Uh, yeah, so, so just let, talking about the funding, I mean, we've been very fortunate um, as a business to have the support of some fantastically patient high net worths. Um, it, there's really three people that have been, you know, funding the bulk of the business for the last 10 years, I would say. Um, and you, you can't get to the position that we have got to without those kind of investors, you know, and we're very grateful to them and they continue to support the business in a, in a brilliant way. Um, I, I think we're at the point now where we're firmly in scale up territory you know, our, our revenues will double this year and they're going to set to do the same next year. And that's that's a combination of the awareness of the category and people really now understanding the power of this technology delivered on a platform. Uh, and I think it's the, the accounts that we have been developing over the last six or seven years, all now growing and expanding. They're all companies with whom we have, you know, multi-year platform licenses so we're firmly in that growth phase um you know we're always interested in um new investors that can uh add value to the growth of the business either specifically in a in a sector you know a, a, an industry sector or in a specific geography so uh, i'm always open to those kinds of uh discussions very interesting. Uh, strategic investors then. Um, thank you uh, for sharing all of this information, giving us an overview of Immerse. This has been very, very interesting to look into um, and very educational, I, I would say. Um, thanks for being with me today, Tom. It's been my pleasure, Luigi. I'm always happy to talk about Immerse. We're very proud to have uh, you know, built a really cutting edge business that is now enjoying some some very positive growth so uh thank you for the chance to speak to you i look forward to seeing all of the very exciting things that are coming up uh from MERS for sure and with all the well with with apple entries in the uh in the industry in the <laughs> um in vr and how you're going to respond to that i'm going to be following you with immense interest great thank you